Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to attend this very important presentation today. We are just going to be talking about the basics of infection control and IPAC policies within the tooth corner dental offices um, that should be followed for best practices. So we are going to be talking about the IPAC principles in regards to safe handling and disposal of waste, environmental cleaning, and care of overall office setting, including the applying the principles of cleaning, disinfecting, and sterilization and storage of instruments and equipment. Um, the whole office strategies that the Tooth Corner is built on is that we try to educate everyone in regards to healthcare workers, assistants, hygienists, or anyone that falls within the office. Um, everyone's role in infection control, that is outlined by our guidelines and principles. We um, continuously review the office IPAC manuals. Um, I know that it is done on a yearly basis, and we also have um, third-party assistance in regards to inspections and help from outside. Uh, we also perform self audits in regards to policies and procedures, um, such as the RCD or so checklist. I know that Dr. Sally had sent it out to multiple offices, if I am correct, in regards to completing it. Um, we also assess the core components of IPAC guidelines, as well as the reprocessing of instruments. So there are four routine practices and principles that we must follow. Um, first of all, in any procedure that we do perform, we have to see the risk assessment. So are we performing aerosol procedures? Are we performing surgical or not? And then we also have the hand hygiene, the use of PPE and the safe handling of disposal and sharps. So for hand hygiene, um, there are written policies and procedures regarding the hand hygiene program. I'm pretty sure if you enter any of the offices, you do see that throughout. Compliance, we all have to follow these guidelines. There is not one person that's subject to it. Um, it has to be available at patient's point of care. So in the operatories, you have to have soap and alcohol-based hand rubs. Um, it has to be practiced before placing on gloves and after glove removal. Personal protective equipment. What are personal protective equipments? We are talking about gloves, gowns, protective eyewear, and masks. PPEs have to be removed prior to leaving the operatory. Um, gloves, masks, gowns, they have to be worn during procedures. And single-use barriers such as masks and gloves must be discarded immediately after every patient. We are not allowed to leave the operatories with used gloves whatsoever. Protective eyewear must be worn during every procedure for all dentists, assistants, hygienists, and patients. And I had um, an assistant actually tell me one time a story where the patient was not wearing the safety glasses and a burr had fallen into their eye. So that's why it's also very important to make sure that your patient is also wearing the safety glasses. Handling and disposal of sharps and containers. So um, percutaneous injuries are the highest risk of bloodborne pathogen transmissions. Best practices must be followed. You have to keep sharps out of reach of patients and you must, them, you must collect them in a clearly labeled puncture resistant container. And those ones would be, um, I believe most of our offices have the yellow and red ones with the hazardous sign. A failure to follow IPAC practices result in a risk of transmission of infectious disease. The most common issues found during IPAC inspections by Public Health of Ontario uh, first one is would be improper flow and reprocessing area. We are going to be talking about that a little bit more in detail. Poor pre-cleaning and cleaning practices, instruments and operatories, improper sterilization, improper packing and storing, reprocessing of single use items and lack of monitoring of record keeping. So there are area specific requirements in regards to everywhere throughout the office. First, you have the waiting rooms, the operatory and clinical areas, the hallways, the reprocessing areas, and the dental laboratories. For waiting rooms, hand hygiene instructions have to, be, signage has to be up 
in the waiting rooms. Um, the stay at home if ill or inform us immediately also has to be up. That's always been recommended. It's not just because of COVID now. Cleanable furniture, so anything that can be wiped, and alcohol-based hand drop has to be available in all waiting areas. In the operatories, there are standard um, requirements that are needed. So smooth and non-porous surfaces. So practically anything that's easily cleanable with hospital grade detergents, cleaners, and disinfectants. Clinical contact surfaces and equipment can be protected by barriers. Example, anything that will be touched by a glove, such as buttons, keyboards, x-rays, equipment, you should be placing a barrier on it. No cloth furnishing or carpeting. Clinical contact surface must be clean and disinfected between every patient and at the end of every working day. You also must allow adequate wet contact time. What I sometimes see throughout generally offices is that they will wipe down the chair really, really well. But then because we are in a rush, what I find is that sometimes we will dry it off. No, allow wet contact time and let it dry off on its own. And then the patient can be brought into the operatory and be sat. Also, you must have an easy access sink that is only for hand washing and do not discard any waste or clean equipment and hand washing sinks. Hand washing sinks are only for hand washing. Liquid soaps must be present in all operatories. I'm not sure why this is like that, but we're going to read it anyway. Um, reprocessing areas, you have to have a sink only for washing. You have to have an ultrasonic washer, an eye wash station within 10 seconds, and a dedicated hand hygiene or sink or alcohol also, um, such as hand sanitizer. And it has to be separate from, from, from the medication preparation area. So if someone is doing surgeries, you cannot have that anywhere near the reprocessing area. So first we are going to start what the cycle is in a reprocessing area. It has to be a one-way flow. So it has to go from dirty to clean. So first of all, you are going to have the receiving, cleaning and decontamination and then you are going to rinse and dry, and then you are going to prepare and package. You're going to send it off for sterilization in the autoclave, and you're going to have it in a storage area where it is the clean side. You cannot have anything that is dirty on the clean side. That is the whole point of a one-way flow. Once it's stored, once the sterilization is done, the storage is done, then you can go ahead and have it to the point of use directly and the cycle goes on and on. This is extremely important because it has been found where some offices will have, not within the tooth corner, but I'm just saying generally on the public health site, is that some offices will have dirty instruments or anything that is not sterile in the storage area of sterile uh, equipment or instruments. So again, we're going to have the point of care. We're going to have the transportation. For transportation to the reprocessing area, I do believe that it does have to be in a closed container, a container so nothing can, um, no, no sharp injuries can occur. Anything that is sharp is going to be placed in something like this. And then you're going to have the pre-cleaning um, with the ultrasonic or just washing and then the ultrasonic, you're going to have the drying with a lint-free cloth. Um, this is the ultrasonic and then you're going to package it properly, label it properly and then place it into the sterilizer. So for pre-cleaning and the cleaning, why is it extremely important? It's extremely important because gross debris can accumulate and then it's very, very hard. So we sometimes tend to see instruments with a little bit of, um, you know, material sticking on it. Why does that happen? It's because the removal of gross debris at the point of care does not happen. So for example, when I am using a ball burnisher, when I'm using a a plastic instrument, if I tend to remove excess, I will always hand it over to my assistant to have it wiped down with either an alcohol gauze or just a dry gauze. It has to be cleaned at the point of care. 
manually cleaned or automated reprocessing. That is when we use the um, ultrasonic cleaner. Brushes are to be cleaned and sterilized every day or discarded. Removal of debris and proteins. Biofilms are resistant to heat and sterilization once formed. It's very, very difficult to remove them. That's why all of this is very important to follow. For reprocessing. We always have to follow the manufacturer instruction for use for any instrument, equipment, or material. Now, sometimes our instruments and equipment can come with a manufacturer instruction. It's those little papers that you find or the little booklets that come with any equipment. If we do not find that or if we happen to lose that, we can always Google the brand or the name and write just MIFU. So it's a manufacturer instructions manual. And then you will have it for that instrument equipment or burr or whatever it is that we are using. We are to never use single use items. Single use items cannot be reprocessed under any circumstance. Now, what? how do we know if it's a single use item? If it's a burr, if it's a syringe, if it's anything that we are not aware of or we're not sure, we're usually going to check the box or the packaging. It will have this signage on them. It's a two, so you cannot use it twice. You have to keep burrs in sterile pouches and new sterilizers. So for every office that obtains a new sterilizer, you have to have three consecutive biological indicators that, that are passed before use. So what does that mean? You cannot put in your first cycle before creating three biological indicators that say that they are a pass, so they are negative. There are no spores growing in it. We have processing challenging devices. Now, what are processing cha challenging devices? Um, so it's the majority of the offices that I've been with in the tooth corner usually have this or something similar to it. So this will open through here. Um, you are going to uncap it. You are going to place the biological indicator in the morning, and then you're going to place a chemical indicator. The whole point of this processing challenging device, it's a test device intended to provide a challenge to the sterilization process. So this little device that you see here, it actually requires more time, pressure, and temperature compared to all other instruments that you have in the load. It is created to challenge your autoclave to see if it will reprocess or if it will sterilize within. Um, a PCD must be used to confirm that the sterilizer has effectively sterilized. And the plate, and it has to be placed at the most difficult site to sterilize in the autoclave. Every autoclave, if you go on Google, it's not magic. If we go on Google, we will find the manufacturer instruction for it. It will say where in the autoclave for any type that we have throughout our offices, it will say where to place this PCD. So what are biological indicators? It's these little tubes. Now, I, these are just pictures to kind of show and give an example of. It's not probably the exact same brand, but it's something similar. They always come in tubes like this. Um, and these ones are, uh, they test spores. They test if anything is growing within the autoclave. So a BI test must be done the morning of every day. So let's go back a little. This is the processing challenging device. We are going to place this piece, this BI in it, and we are going to place a class five chemical indicator. I'm going to show you what that is. And then we are going to pouch it. We are going to label it with the date, time, cycle load, sterilizer used, and the initials, just like any other instrument that we would. And then we are going to place a chemical five indicator. We already said that, and the class three and four are already on the pouches. We have to use a control and document the results. Now, what is a control? In this little machine or something similar that we have like it, there is going to be one that is labeled C at the top or over here that we are going to place right at the same time where we have this one over here that's been processed in the sterilizer, okay? Temperature, pressure, and time must be checked after every cycle before you release the pouches for point of view. So we do this in the morning and what allows us to release it is because we are checking that the parameters have been met, time, pressure, and temperature. 
Now, as for implants, temporary anchorage devices, or surgical screws, biological indicators must be used in every load. So if we have an implant or anything regard, in regards to implants, we have to have a biological indicator within the sterilization cycle. Releasing the load or package, and I think this is very important to understand because it kind of explains of why things are done. If we are waiting for the BI results, it's not possible to release the load, but you can and you must evaluate the class 5 chemical indicator that you did place in a PCD. So that is why we always say you have to place the processing challenging device every morning with a class five indicator in the BI. You release that, right? So that we are sterilizing throughout the day. We still don't need to do the BI for the rest of the cycles if we don't need to, but we have to place the PCD with a class five chemical indicator just to justify that we are doing the release of routine loads. So all packages have to contain, or all packages have to have a type five class five indicator if we're not placing it in the PCD. So the easier choice is to not place the class five indicator in every pouch, but just with every cycle that we're doing, place a PCD with a class five chemical indicator. There also has to be a contingency plan for recall and procedural plan in the event of failure. So if a sterilizer is saying that there's an error or the physical parameters have not been met or any of anything is not passing, then we have to have a contingency plan. We have to recall all the instruments. We have to see what is the load number. We have to see where it was used or if it was used. Now, usually you are checking that before releasing the load so you can take control of it. The numbers, so load numbers of all packages used on a patient, they must be recorded on the patient's progress notes. It creates such a less hassle for us. So again, releasing the load, sorry about the click to add text. Um, you can have a class five in each pouch, or you can have a class four inside each pouch. I'm going to show you what a class four looks like. And then with a class five in a PCD within each load, PCD must be placed in a pouch too. So if you come over here and you look, this is what a class five looks like. This is what goes into the processing challenging device. These over here are also chemical indicators. I'm not sure. So I know that the internal one is a class four. So you don't need to be placing class fours inside PCDs. This is a class four. This is a class three. And this is also another class. These ones have to have a color change. Now, if you see, it's, it clearly says it on the class five chemical indicators. If the darkness, if a gray point, black point has passed this, that means you are allowed to use it. If it has not, then you cannot use it. You have to recall everything. So um, we do have the BI monitoring and documentation. Now, Dr. Sally was very kind enough to share the ones that she had used in her office. And uh, we also use them throughout the tooth corner. She will be sharing them throughout all the offices, just in case that um, any of our offices don't have it, but I'm pretty sure that we do because we all use them. This is what they kind of look like. We have different logs for different cycles. So for example, this one is the closed cycle. So everything is pouched, everything is labeled, everything is sterilized. Um, we have to place the date. So the sterilizer model, it depends on whether your office has more than one sterilizer or not. Usually the smaller offices, we do have one, I believe, or at least my offices do. Um, we have to write the date of the cycle that it has been done, the time, the cycle type. So you can write, is it wrapped, unwrapped, anything like that. And then the cycle number, there is a load number. That is what goes on your bag also. And then the number bags in the cassette. So practically within the autoclave. And then the physical parameters, time, pressure, and temperature. The results of class four indicator and the results of class five indicator inside a PCD. So is it a pass or a fail? Also, initial of the person who has checked the result not who has entered the person who has entered it 
into the autoclave is the one that is going to sign on it. So on the pouch, you are going to be placing your initials. The person who has checked the result, that is the person, if it's the same person, then by all means, same thing. But if it's another person, you have to make sure your initials are on there. Now, the lack of documentation is probably one of the most, not probably, it is actually one of the most serious things with public health. So if you don't, if I believe that if you do something and it is not documented, then that will create a bigger problem because even if I believe you, if it's not on the log, that means it is not done because logs are supposed to be left for 10 years after. And then we also have one for unwrapped cycles. We also have one for the uh, ultrasonic cleaner. So we are going to be sharing everything in regards to that. Now, um, mechanical parameters such as temperature, time, and pressure, the printouts or USBs must be verified and checked. Verification of specific cycles and physical parameters. Logs must be kept for a minimum of 10 years. We've already said that. So some sterilizers have USB devices. Others have printouts. Others don't have anything. If it's a USB, so if you have a USB plugged in within your sterilizer, you have to check you have to download them on a computer on a secure one that you can keep record of um, for 10 years that it shows that it has passed. It'll simply say temperature passed. It'll say the temperature it's reached, the pressure and the time, and it will say whether it passed or failed. If it is a printout, you must also record those and keep them. Um, and it will also indicate that if it's passed or not. So just in case there is a sterilizer failure, so a, a biological indicator that is positive, that means the spores have grown. What does that mean? The biological indicator that was placed in the PCD, once you place it into that little device for 20, I believe all of ours are 24 hours if I am correct. If there is a color change, not in the control, but in the biological indicator that was placed in the PCD, that means your sterilization cycle has failed. You have to hold all instruments and document that it has failed, that you have held them, that you have not released them, that you have tried to regain them. If the cause can be found in the, bio, um, in the sterilizer of why, now we do have technicians on hand, you just have to notify either front desk or office managers. And I believe we do have a person that comes in right away and they do check everything and they see what is the cause. If the cause can be found, you can repeat one BI test immediately with the same type of cycle. So if it's an unwrapped cycle that passed, you have to place a BI that's unwrapped. If you have, if you place a cycle that is wrapped, you have to use the same cycle. The same cycle has to be used. Um, then if you have that BI and there's no pores, spores growing. If there are no spores growing, then you can go ahead and reuse the sterilizer, but you have to document everything. Um, and you also have to make sure that physical chemical indicators indicate advocate for processing of the sterilizer and that you can, you, you can put it back to service. If the repeat BI with the same cycle is positive again, so there is a color change, that means the sterilizer must remain out of service until inspected. Every single item from the load, it doesn't matter what it is, you have to recall it and reprocess it. Autoclave pouches. It's very simple. You have to have the date of when you enter it. You have to have the sterilizer used. You have to have the cycle or load number. And then you have to have the initials. You cannot have one of these missing. You have to have all four pieces of information on it. Now, if I believe, I'm not sure we can ask Dr. Sally once we are done, but I believe if you only have one sterilizer use, you don't really typically have to write what the sterilizer name is, but you do have to write the date, cycle, load, and initials. We are going to confirm that with Dr. Sally when we're done. Now, the pouches, 
they have to be loosely packed, no more than 75% flow to allow for proper steam flow and penetration to items. So what usually happens inside an autoclave, you kind of have to imagine it. You have pouches that are filled with instruments. The whole point is that it has to heat to a specific time. It has to create that pressure to a specific amount. And then the pouches are going to be filled with kind of air. So they're going to expand. If these pouches are too filled, they don't have the enough pressure and heat going in them to expand. Therefore, your sterilization is less effective. you must write on the clear plastic side or have labels to avoid any damaging of the paper or leakage of ink into the pouch. If this happens, the integrity is lost. So any labeling that happens cannot be on anything that is paper because once we put it in the sterilizer, what will happen is you have heat, you have water, you have a lot of pressure and it's going to leak into this inside, but the plastic is going to contain it. So you have to write, on the plastic side and not the paper side because ink will leak. As for hand pieces, high speeds, low speeds, profi angles, air water, syringe tips, and ultrasonic instruments, they all have to be sterilized. You also have to discharge air and water for a minimum of 20 seconds after every patient use. So I finished with an ultrasonic tip. I have to discharge water from it for 20 seconds. I finish from a high speed. I have to discharge water from it for 20 seconds. Low speed, same thing. Just run it on for 20, uh, 20 seconds. Air water syringes. I usually just press both air and water for 20 seconds and that usually rinses it out and then it goes to sterilization. Devices that are attached to air water lines are to be sterilized after each patient use. If it's permanently attached, then you must cover with a barrier and disinfect with a medical grade disinfectant after every patient. And then you have to rebarrier it. You cannot keep the same barrier. So those blue barriers that we usually use, you cannot keep the same one if you have one on for the previous patient. Storage of sterile single-use items. You cannot store sterile single-use items on the dirty side of reprocessing area. So that is the backflow that we were talking about. This reprocessing area has to be a single flow. It has to go from dirty to the sterilization area to the sterile area. You cannot have anything from dirty to clean, uh, sorry, yeah, from dirty to clean or sterile and sterile to dirty. There's the whole concept is loss of sterilization. You have to keep sterile to the point of care. So storage is extremely important. If you sterilize something, keep it in the clean area, um, keep it in the sterile, sterile area of the reprocessing where you can, and then you can take it to the point of care. You cannot store anything under sinks, counters, or adjacent sinks, because then they can get wet or contaminated. So just try to have that division within the office where this is sterile, this is dirty, this is where it's going to be stored, and this is where it's going to be used. Single items are to not be sterilized or reprocessed under any circumstance. There, there should be no need. They must be clearly labeled that is single use and not reprocessed whatsoever. Now, we have ultrasonic units throughout all our offices. The ultrasonic offices, now this is just an example of the shared guideline with me. Uh, we will be circulating, I believe we also have them, I know we have it in my offices, but we also have them in all the other offices. We're going to redistribute them, I believe Dr. Sally said so. Um, with all the offices, there is a full instruction in regards to how to do the ultrasonic unit testing. Uh, how to reprocess wrapped cycle, unwrapped cycle. It's actually a detailed and step-by-step -step, uh, process that we are going to be sharing with all the assistants in the offices if it's not already in your offices, but it is in the guidelines 
the iPad guidelines that we do have. Now you have to test your ultrasonic unit. So those little tubs that we have in the reprocessing area, ultrasonic testing has to be done at least one times per week. We call that the foil test. Okay. So if we look at it, the ultrasonic cleaner is filled with two uh, two third filled with water. And then the correct dosage of cleaning concentrate is added to the water. Every office uses a different one. So whichever one you have, you have to look into that. The water and concentrate is mixed uh, well for a minimum of 10 minutes. You have to, so what is the foil testing procedure? You have to lay the aluminum foil across the wire frame. You place the wire frame with the aluminum foil in the ultrasonic cleaner, turn on the ultrasonic cleaner without heating and then turn off the ultrasonic cleaner after 60 seconds and then you remove the foil tank so what happens is you have to have this penetration um, or the perforations and do you see these ones these are tiny tiny holes in the foil and we also label when it's done just so the person that's going to document it we also have uh, record keeping for that it has to be recorded if you find these perforations that means your ultrasonic is effectively working there's also i believe another test where you write with a pencil and then if the pencil marking is gone i don't really like that one because you can't really rely on it this is the best way to do it so dental unit water lines and suction lines staff training for water quality, biofilm formation, and water treatment methods and maintenance protocols for water and delivery systems. Waterline heaters cannot be used. That is by public health. That is not by us. Dental water lines purge at each workday flushing with water for at least two minutes every morning. So you have suction lines, and then you also have the handpiece lines. You have to flush these for two minutes every day. Uh, with water. 20 seconds between every patient, hand pieces, syringe tips, everything must be removed prior. Suction lines also have to be purged every morning for two minutes. And then you have to, and 20 seconds between every patient. And you also have to have a log of that. If you do not have a log, that means it is not done. An enzymatic cleaner for suction lines is recommended at least one time per week. So we have these little enzyme tablets. We have to do that at least one time per week. So office manuals, written policies, and reprocessing procedures. Throughout every office, we clearly have the manuals. They are with our sign. They say the tooth corner. Sorry, I'm not sure what is happening. We talked about the foil testing and now we're going to talk about dental radiography equipment. So any accessories um, or taking for taking x-rays such as buttons, x-ray sensors and x-ray tubes, hands, they must be barriered and disinfected between every patient use. You have to change barriers. There's no reason why you have to have a barrier and use it for the same patient. Um, even if you do wipe it down, because the whole concept behind that is that the barrier does have a sticky side and then you can have debris around that area. Um, gloves must be worn when taking radiographs and accessories such as XCPs must be sterilized after every patient. These sensors, they have to be disinfected with the medical grade disinfectant, although they are barriered. For dental laboratory, uh, laboratory asepsis. So when we do an impression, uh, prothesis have to, and prothesis, they have to be cleaned and disinfected before uh, blood and organic debris dry. So you take out the impression, you have to disinfect them and clean them before you send them out to the lab. As for wet impressions, such as alginate, they have to be placed in an impermeable bag, such as a Ziploc bag for transportation to the lab. You, for injectables and safe handling, you have to try to avoid multi-dose vials if it's possible. Um, if not, of course, you're allowed to use it. You just have to disinfect it between every patient and follow proper protocols. Hand hygiene is also very important and you do not preload syringes such as local anesthetic. So don't bring out all the syringes in the office in the morning of or throughout the day and prepare two, three syringes for the next two to three patients. No, you have to keep it sterile until the point of care. Also, um, one more thing, what I notice a lot of assistants do is they uncap the 
um, the syringe, the local anesthetic syringe while giving it to the dentist. I personally, if anybody has worked with me, I don't like to do that because it can create um, injuries and I just try to avoid it. I think that everyone and anyone can. Again, it is a personal preference, but I, I do personally prefer that. It just, you have less punctures to the and wounds to the skin. So we're gonna do a little overview and a quick overview. Uh, we do have a lot of instruments and materials that we do use. Uh, one thing that I have to stress out is mirrors. They have to be dis disassembled. So you cannot have the handle of the mirror with the mirror like this and sterilize it. You have to disassemble this, sterilize the mirror with the handle separately. So in, you can have it in the same pouch, but it has to be separated unless your mirror, obviously you cannot disassemble it because it just comes as one piece. Uh, second thing is for endophiles, uh, there are some, uh, some manufacturers create that they are single use and you will find this sign on them. And some of them are not for single use. So you can sterilize them. You have to follow the manufacturer instructions. I really suggest you um, try to look into that because that is very important. Also burrs, we have multiple, uh, uh, burrs in, throughout the office. There's carbide, there's diamond, there's all sorts. So please follow the manufacturer instructions. If it says to not sterilize or, or do not use twice, then you shouldn't be using it. Um, also, same thing for um, any endo systems that you guys are using. Single use is strictly for single use. You cannot. Now, some of the instruments or the materials, they would tell you on the package that you have to sterilize before the usage. So also look into that. This, you cannot sterilize. This is strictly a single use. It doesn't matter what you used it for or what you used it on. You cannot sterilize a single use syringe. So you always have to read the manufacturer instruction. If not, let's just try to use our brain. Single use cannot be re-sterilized, cannot be reprocessed. You used it for one patient, it is to be discarded appropriately. All right, so we have common problems um, that public health has found. So first of all, no daily biological indicators. Some offices, were not, and you can actually go on to public health website for Ontario and you will find the office um, common problems that they have, no biological indicators every day, or they were doing it, they claimed that they were doing it, but they were not recording it. They, there's no logs of it. It's as simple as if you do not have a log of it, then it was not ever done. Not pre-cleaning instruments, debris on instruments, rusted instruments, incomplete or lack in sterilization logbooks. Like again, I said, logbooks are very important. Also, you have to, at the point of care, so hand over to your assistant before any glass ionomer cement or any temporary cement bond, anything does stick on your surface before it gets to the reprocessing area that does need to be wiped down. We usually do do that um, at point of care because, you know, we were back and forth in the patient's mouth, so an alcohol gauze should be sufficient. Also, uh, packages with instruments that are sterilized and the instruments have debris on them. What do I mean by debris? They have material stuck on them. Clean them out. You can use a burr, you can use a hemostat. It does happen, I'm not saying it doesn't, but you it can be cleaned if you want to clean them. So you cannot have anything stuck on any instruments after the point of sterilization. Mm -hmm. Failure to follow IPAC practices resulting in risk of transmission of disease. Also storage burrs, not in pouches and loose items. You can have, even if they are brand new burrs, but you have them in a burr block, either sterilize them and keep them pouched or just keep them in their original packaging. You can't have loose burrs in a drawer or loose instruments or loose mm -hmm. items for any reason whatsoever. One thing that they also found in common was rubber stoppers off the endo so the files for the endo, the rubber stoppers, they have to come off before processing because if they don't come off, the whole concept is beneath that rubber stopper, that means it's not sterile. So you're using an endo item on a patient 
that is technically not sterilized and that's unacceptable. Uh, loose items and cluttered areas. Try to keep everything within offices organized, especially the jars. I know that it can be a little bit overwhelming because the tooth corner does provide everything. So we do tend to have a lot of material, but just try to organize everything accordingly and in a very, very mannered way. Also, one common thing that they also found was the reprocessing areas. They would either find food, water, drinks, or even just a glass of water, just an empty glass of water. So that is also unacceptable. For education and training, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Sally, but the tooth corner IPAC policies are reviewed yearly and whenever needed. I know that that is done because I actually tend to read a new manual every year for that I've been with the tooth corner. So please get familiar with it. You have to make sure you've read it. You have to make sure you've revised it. I know that we all think we do know infection control, but the world is changing. There's so many new equipment. There's so many new things. And that is why we create these manuals so it can help everybody. If you don't know something, you can simply ask your colleague or even go look at the manual. I, I've revised it. I've reviewed it. It literally has everything. So there is no need for anyone to have an IPAC lapse for any reason whatsoever. We also have third party inspectors. Every office gets a third party inspector that comes in and goes through with the assistant or the office manager. I don't know how every office is done. And then they give us a re yearly review. And then after that yearly review, if there are any recommendations, we correct them and then they come in for another inspection or they make sure that we follow them. Also, we have the public health website. If you go on there, and I recommend this to be done on an every year basis, just as a refresher, um, because we things can be missed. We're all human, we do make mistakes, but the whole point of this is for training, education, and you have to have the ability to improve every year and the willing willingness to. So public health website does have specific manuals or specific, I believe that there's um, a, not courses, but little tests that you do on, they give you for every topic, you kind of have a little review and then you do a little question and you get a certificate for it. I find that those ones are also very, very helpful. There's also the Royal College of Dental Surgeons of Ontario, the IPAC guideline. They do have, um, they do have a guideline for that. Also, again, what Dr. Sally had circulated previously was the public healthy checklist. Now I recommend a yearly or a yearly review for that checklist because again we do it by weekly we, we do it by annual it's semi-annual <laughs> so it's it's every year semi -annual. Or twice a year twice a year twice. biannual what are you doing biannual dr sally the checklist so the, the checklist we're doing it twice audit. a year yeah. right mm -hmm. yeah 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 i was going to say every six months i just wasn't sure so within the offices that i am in that is what we are practicing so like dr sally said we are going to be doing it biannually um just dr sally i would like um one thing so if we could just share tomorrow or today whenever you're free that checklist again and the um, the, the document that you had sent me for the step-to-step -step sterilization within the office. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I, I know that every office probably has it, but again, let's just, uh, give a refresher to everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Does anybody have any question? You can type in your questions while I uh, give like a, a recap kind of thing. So uh, we had a meeting with our third party assessors this morning and uh, they actually do the assessment once a year. They come into the office, they check our protocols and then they um, give advice, they give the report and they follow uh, up with another visit to make sure that whatever area of, you know, um, improvement uh, that was done, uh, then we can um, then we can um, kind of uh, make sure that it's meeting the standards, right? So they mentioned a few points where you know they have been uh, 
noticing them among uh, our offices repeatedly. So I'd like to focus on those areas. So um, one of them was the sterilization monitoring and documentation. Uh, we all have the logs but the logs are not being um, kind of filled and completed uh, regularly or by all staff. So please make sure that there is like, this is a zero tolerance um, thing. If you're sterilizing, if you're like a floater, if you're an assistant, if you're a hygienist, you're sterilizing your instruments, you must use the log uh, when you're um, uh, inputting the packages into the sterilizer. And if you're taking something out of the sterilizer, you must pass uh, and check the PCD, like Dr. Wei mentioned, and you must uh, check all uh, class fours on, um, on the packages before um, circulating the, the items. Another thing is proper loading of the sterilizer and the, and the pouches. So don't overload the unit and don't overload the pouch. When you lay it flat on a table, you should be able to see all instruments. So don't like, uh, there should be no overlap of instruments. Another thing is the labeling of pouches. I know some offices have the stamp, others may not, but really it's just, you know, a date, your initial and um, the cycle number. If you're using one sterilizer in the office, you don't need to note the sterilizer um, like model or number. Uh, something about the PCD, if you do not have a PCD, what you can use is uh, a pouch with a lot of instruments in it, uh, like a lot, like uh, jammed with instruments, and then you can put the class five in the middle of, um, of those instruments. Uh, something about fallow time and failure to fully adhere to fallow times post uh, aerosol producing uh, procedures. So fallow time begins when the patient and all clinical staff have exited the operatory and close the door. The operatory must remain vacant during the fallow time, necessary, uh, like the time that's necessary to achieve 99% uh, removal of the airborne uh, contaminants. Uh, this is uh, from the RCDSO website. So we all have had our, um, um, har uh, not HARP, what's it called, that other reports. Uh, HVAC, <laughs> HVAC assessment, and we all know what's the fallow time for each uh, one of our ops, so please follow that. Another thing that they mentioned, uh, I think that's, I think that's it. Now, if anyone has any questions about the steps of um, processing uh, the biological indicator, please get in touch. Uh, I have shared the online modules that Dr. Wiam have mentioned. They are uh, from Public Health Ontario. There are public health, um, like there are um, green, sorry, uh, where is it? Yeah, it's sent at 10.22. So these are links to the online modules and they need to be uh, completed at least once a year by all clinical staff. Um, and uh, the certificate is to be handed to your uh, to your manager. I will be sending it by email as well, just in case you know someone uh, is not attending live with us. What else, okay, Sally? I'm sorry, I don't want to interrupt you, but all clinical staff that includes every single assistant, every assistant single hygienist, hygienist floater. Oh, are dentists required to do it? No, I personally um, do. It. I personally do it for the knowledge of it because when I have a pouch or I see something within an office, if I'm working in, I'd like to detect it. Right. So mm -hmm. I personally do it, but I don't know if it's mandatory. Just when you say um, we are, we are bound to follow our RCDSO guidelines. So we, um, it is, you know, we are expected okay. to know what's written in the IPAC standards of the RCDSO. But sometimes, um, you know, floaters and people like co-op students and stuff, um, people like that, they do need to uh, do the online modules. Okay. Um, I also mentioned in the chat uh, when Dr. Wiam was mentioning the, the mirrors and how they should be separate, uh, separated from the handles. Um, hinged instruments 
So your hemostat, your um, uh, your scissors, um, things like that, they must be sterilized, open, and unlocked. Other than that, uh, masks, gloves, uh, gauze, anything that is clean and sterile and single use cannot be stored near dirty areas in the reprocessing uh, room. What's, uh, I think that's, oh, one thing about um, arrival times. So assistants, please make sure you arrive a minimum of 30 minutes before your first patient. Now, if you are covering in an office for the first time, I need you to arrive to the office a minimum of one hour before your first patient. Yes, that may mean that the front desk or whoever is working in the office may open the office a little earlier, but it's important for you to familiarize yourself with the flow of that specific office. So please, um, this will help, um, you know, a sm for smoother, um, you know, smoother uh, flow during the whole day. Now, there are some questions. Dr. Um, Sally, can we just discuss two things um, in regards to what you said for fallow time? And correct me if I'm wrong. So what fallow time is, it's to let this room settle after you've done an aerosol procedure. So mm -hmm. what that typically means, if I understand it correctly, is that you are to take your instruments and mm -hmm. evacuate the room and shut the door for that specific HVAC test time that you've been given for each room. Am I right? So correct. For example, that is after, that is only after 20 to 25 minutes, I believe, if I remember correctly, we always leave it shut for 30 minutes. And then the assistant can go back and wipe everything down and clean. That is what um, the third party had explained to us in the Scarborough location. Yeah, so that is, I'm not sure if that was before or after they changed the percentage. Uh, I think it was 99.99 and then now it's 99% only. Um, but yes, so technically the room has to be empty for that time. So they are not to wipe anything it's because when aerosols are created, they're in the air, they're going to settle on a surface. So if you initially wipe down everything, you are going to have decontamination again. So you have to leave the room, take your instruments, go sterilize, leave the room, let it settle for that amount of time. And then we can come back to wipe down. This is what they had explained if anybody wanted further details. Mm -hmm. Okay. And in regards to the biological indicators, so the control, it's the one that's, it has to be labeled with a C, so for control, and then it has to be cracked and placed into that little device. That's the one that hasn't been into the sterilizer. As for the one that is, has been into the sterilizer, it's supposed to be placed with the control. Now the control is supposed to change color. Am I correct, Dr. Sally? Uh, the control, yeah, the control, the yes. It hasn't been sterilized, right? So the uh -huh. spore will grow. So you guys mm -hmm. will see a color change in the control. The control, again, is the one that has not been into the sterilizer. Whereas the one that has been into the sterilizer, you are going to see it the same color. You're not supposed to see spores grow. Correct? Yeah. Okay. I'm now, just going for everyone. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Now, there is a suggestion, um, and again, to make sure that um, we check and double check things. Um, for those who are taking um, the pouches out of the sterilizer, uh, their initials are to be uh, written on the pouch to make sure that they have checked all the like all the pouches and all the class fours and class five and everything. So maybe it's too much work. We will see if that is a requirement and if that and if this will help uh, make sure that um, all of our um, instruments are properly sterilized. Um, alternatively, you can just initial uh, in the log um, of the sterilization. Um, like the sterilization, the sterilization log uh, under wrapped or unwrapped or uh, whatever cycle you're using that you have inspected 
all, um, all of the pouches to make sure that the sterilization process um, is complete. All right, so we are going to start with the first question. For a sterilizer that has no recording device, a chemical indicator of five or six must be placed in every package. The answer for that one is true. So there are different sterilizers that either have a recording device, so you either have a printout or a USB, or some are very old that they simply don't. For those ones that do not have those recording devices to tell you temperature, time, and pressure have been met for that specific cycle, you do have to place a class five or six in every single package. If you do have the USB or the printout, then you can just place one class five with the PCD in every cycle. All water lines must be purged at the beginning of each working day for at least. So water lines in regards to the hand pieces or the suction lines. Uh, is it 20 seconds, 60? No, it's two minutes. Every morning you have to purge it for two minutes. Between every patient, it is at least 20 seconds and a log has to be kept for that. If a log is not done for the water lines between every patient and in the morning, that means it was not done. Single use items can be reprocessed if done correctly with medical grade disinfectants and proper sterilization, including a BI and chemical five indicator. Now I kind of expanded this question because it was more of a trick question. No, you cannot reprocess any single use item. If it's single use, it's just by the name. You can only use it once. It doesn't matter if you have a biological indicator, a class five chemical, it doesn't matter if you soak it in bleach and cabicide. No, you can only use it once. You cannot reprocess any single use item. For a sterilizer with a USB device, the USB can be downloaded and checked monthly, weekly, daily at the end of the day or daily at the end of every cycle. Believe it or not, the majority had answered daily at the end of the day. That is actually incorrect because you have to do it at the uh, daily and at the end of every cycle. I know it is hard. I know it is difficult, but that is the whole point of checking that your time, temperature, and pressure have been met. That is how you sign off on a log that you have released that load. Which of the following is not required to be written on a sterilization pouch? Cycle number, date, sterilizer, use, initial of healthcare worker. Now, this one, I would, I would say it's sterilizer used if you only have one sterilizer. If you have more than one sterilizer in your office, then the answer would be none of the above. So that means you have to write all of these three, uh, all of these four. While working on a patient, the same gloves may be worn while obtaining an instrument from another area of the clinic only if it is to be used on the same patient. That answer is false. If you are in an operatory and you are going to leave the operatory to get anything for any reason, you cannot leave the operatory with the same gloves. You have to take off your gloves. It's, it, you're decontaminating the rest of the clinic from that one patient use. So you have to, even if it's for the same patient, you're just gonna go grab something from the reprocessing area or a drawer in the other operatory. No, you have to remove your gloves and disinfect your hands prior to leaving the operatory. If hands are visibly if soiled- I may, um, If yeah? I may interrupt, sorry. Yeah. So even if you are in the same op, taking out a cotton roll, or a gauze or a pouch from a drawer, you must either take off your gloves or use a tweezer to take uh, out whatever you need for that patient within the room. Yes, that is correct. All right, can I continue? If hands are visibly soiled, you may use 70% alcohol-based hand drug. So there are two concepts to have a hand hygiene program. If your hands, you see either dirt on them, blood, or anything for any reason, you cannot use the hand sanitizer. You have to wash your hand with soap. 
If your hands don't have any visible soil, then you can use the alcohol hand drug. Chemical indicators must remain in their original color after the sterilization cycle is complete in, in order to obtain a pass. So for any chemical indicator, you know, those little tiny pink, blue um, triangles or circles on the pouch, they actually have to change color in order for them to go for a pass. That is how you check that your, your pouches have passed, they have to change color, including your class five chemical indicator. Thank you so much and good night. Thank you so much, Dr. Wiam. That was a lot of hard work. Oh, there is a hand. And one quick thing, okay? Yes, sure. The whole purpose of this lecture is for everyone to learn. There is not a single person that is not bound to learn from this. Um, it's not, we're not, you know, judging or anything. So if you do have questions, please do reach out to Dr. Sally, read your protocols. Also, this is not Infection control can be overwhelming, and it is the responsibility of every single person within the office. It's not just the assistant, it's not just the hygienist, it's not just the dentist, it's a collective effort. So we are human, we can make mistakes, but if somebody sees something, please do correct it, or at least inform the person to correct it, because like I said, it is a joint effort. So if I have a pouch, as a dentist, it comes to me, and I always check my indicators and I see that there is something wrong, I will go back to make sure that it is corrected. So it's not a one person job. And please do reach out to Dr. Sally if you do have any questions. Um, Dad, you had your hands up and then you lowered your hand. Was your question answered? I, no, not really. I, I have a question, but I said maybe I can send it by email for you. It's up to you, sure. Uh, or I can ask here. Everybody can uh, can listen if you don't mind. Uh -huh. For the indicator itself, when we put it in the uh, autoclave and we put it in the machine, it has to take 24 hours to give, to give the result. Correct. Yeah. And after we get the result, like mm -hmm. suppose it is yellow, it's mm -hmm. not purple. Mm -hmm. So in this case, you don't think the whole instruments that we we have been sterilized and then we have to use it again, because as you know, we don't have that much instruments. It's not us only. There's mm -hmm. so many offices, they have limited instruments. Mm -hmm. So so this this should be something that happens very, very rarely. Right. And yes, if you have um, a biological indicator that changed color or failed the test um, the next morning, you will find out about it. Right. Even though you passed to the loads based on your PCD and class five and class four indicators, if your mm -hmm. BI failed the test, you must recall all um, packages and um, verify like what was wrong and run another cycle um, on that sterilizer. If it passed, only then you can um, re-sterilize re the loads and um, pass them to the point of care. Now you can prioritize what, you know, what is to be sterilized first if you have like patients um, uh, waiting and stuff. Mm -hmm. But yes, that is correct. If it's yellow, you do need to recall. And that is why as well, you do need to have the package numbers or like the load number that was used for a patient noted on every progress note. Uh, so for example, I saw a patient for a filling uh, and I used three, pou three pouches with a basic set, a handpiece and whatever, like a syringe. I need to note the load numbers of these pouches on the patient's progress note in case a recall is to be made. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. No problem.